What a great psalm. That's where we're going to be, Psalm 145. Hope you'll join me turning in your Bible or on your device. Uh, Excited to be here this morning. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, Quick update. I haven't been around very much this summer. I had a stroke in June and heart surgery in August, and I'm feeling a lot better. So thank you for all of your prayers. Uh, thanks for all of your prayers and, and kindness and, and just all of the support. And uh, my apologies if I have a hard time talking to you sometimes. So <laughs> sometimes it's, it's not as good as other times, but actually I'm doing really well. But we are in Psalm 145 this morning. Uh, what a great song. Research shows that 90% of us in the room have suffered an infection in the last seven days. We call this bug an earworm, commonly. Uh, Don't worry, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's when a song gets stuck in your head. The technical term is involuntary musical imagery, and there's actually a lot of research about this. It's a phenomenon that occurs spontaneously and without conscious control. One article discussing earworms writes this, Wandering minds and stress seem to make people more vulnerable to earworms. And if you're a chronic worrier, you're not only more likely to have an internal soundtrack, but you're also more likely to be bothered by it. Whether it's baby shark or mbop or kung fu fighting, those are my gifts to you, so you can sing those later. Pick whichever one. No matter what it is, we've all had the experience of a song rattling around our head that we couldn't wait to silence and get it out of there. I frequently at home, when I wake up with an earworm, which happens a lot, uh, I then subject my family to it. I pull it up on Spotify and play it loudly at the breakfast table. Well, this is where Psalm 145 comes in for us this morning. This was a song that David willfully and voluntarily put into his head every single day. He planned on singing it forever, according to the lyrics of the song. And though it isn't one of the most famous psalms, when people list the most famous psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Psalm 121, 139, this isn't one of the most famous psalms, but it is one of the most interesting. It is the last of David's songs. At least, it's the final psalm to bear his name. In the superscript above verse 1, it's called a hymn of David, or your version may say a praise of David. A Bible scholar, J.J. Perone, writes this, This is the only psalm which is called a tehillah, which is the Hebrew word for a praise or hymn. The plural of that word, tehillim, is the general name for the entire book of Psalms. Bible commentator John Phillips writes, This psalm brings all of David's other psalms to a climax. In the Jewish Talmud, uh, which was used by rabbis to establish practices and customs and culture for the Jewish people, Jews were instructed to recite this psalm three times a day. And in the Jewish prayer book, this psalm is the one that is most referenced of all the others. David is not only planning to sing this song forever and ever, he's also invited each of us to join with him. And what a great song to sing and to wrap around our hearts. I'm so glad we were able to hear it read just all together at once before we sort of go through the text in a less musical way, in a slower way. Because as you, as you hear it read, what stands out the most is how incredibly optimistic David is about his God, about his life, and about his future. We live in pessimistic times, don't we? But God's people always have reason to be optimistic. We always have reason to have overflowing joy coming out of us because, not because things are always good or circumstances are always good, but because our God is always great. He is always good. He is always with us. And he is doing all that he has promised without fail and without hesitation. That's the message of this incredible psalm. And so today, we're all invited to get this lovely song stuck in our heads and our hearts. Let's look at verse 1. A hymn of David. I exalt you, my God the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. This psalm is an acrostic. Maybe you've encountered this when you look at Psalm 119 in your Bible where it shows the letters of the Hebrew alphabet above each section. Every verse of this song 
uh, starts with a consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, David seemed to like doing this. At least five of his psalms follow this pattern. But he's not being formulaic. He's not just churning out one more song for people to sing. It's very clear that he is overflowing with real excitement. Herbert Lockyer said this psalm is vibrating with praise to God. And I just encourage you, you know, later today or this week, put this psalm on like we did before in audio format on the YouVersion app. You can always listen to the Bible in audio and just listen to it read and hear the excitement and the exuberance and the praise here. And David opens his song with, I exalt you, my God, the King. We don't know what phase of life David was in when he wrote this, but we do know that overall, throughout his life, David's heart remained in this position. Not perfectly. He made his mistakes. He had his troubles. You know, he, he, he had his own problems. But throughout his life, from youth to old age, he, his heart was inclined to the Lord. He was after the Lord. And so even though he was king, even though he was uniquely chosen by God, even though he was the giant slayer, the man who won the hearts of Israel, the sweet psalmist, all of these things, his goal was to make the Lord high and honored in his heart and from his lips. Despite David's power and prestige, he understood that God alone was worthy of praise. And he says, I'm going to bless the Lord. And to bless the Lord here isn't just to say nice things. It means to kneel in salute and obedience to the Lord. And he identifies the Lord here as God and King. As God, he is creator and sustainer and savior. As King, he is decider, director, and commander. And in this opening, David not only reveals what he thinks about God, he also shows us a few thoughts he has about himself. First, he was very concerned with giving the Lord glory. He says, I, I, I care about that. I want to give the Lord glory. And second, he recognized that he, David, was going to live forever. And he wanted to worship God every day, not just in this life, but for all eternity. He says, hey, this is the plan. We talk about our you know, one-year plan, five-year plan, retirement plan. I said, my plan is I want to worship the Lord every day, now and forever. Phillips again writes this, David determined never to let a day go by without discovering some way to freight it down with praise. Love that image and that description. That as David awoke each morning meditating on the Lord, he thought, how can I freight my life down with praise today? And what a great reminder this is for us that we as, as believers are able to involve ourselves right now in eternal activities. This temporal life can have a real eternal impact, not only in bringing others to the Lord and serving the Lord in, in different ways, but also, as we learn in the Psalms, in bringing worship. As we worship God, that has an, an eternal impact. That is an eternal investment that the Lord rewards us for. That, that accomplishes a great everlasting work, even though we're here in this mortal life. Verse 3 says, the Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. David did a lot of praising. He wrote a lot of songs. Uh, but every time when he paused to think about God, when he entered the house of the Lord to bring worship, when he sat down to write a new song, every time he paused to consider God, his conclusion was always the same. Man, the Lord is great. He is so great, great in power, great in love, great in redemption, great in generosity. And, and David shows that the more that he thought, the more he came to the realization that we as human beings can never come close to fathoming the greatness of God. There, we can never get to the limit. We can never get to the end. We can never redline our, the, our understanding of God's greatness. One resource said this, when humans utter words of praise for God, it is as though we are drawing a sunset with only a pencil. That's a great image as well. Uh, undoubtedly, all of you have seen or even done a, a sketch of a sunset with just a pencil. And if you look at it, you can see, well, yeah, it's meant to be a sunset, but all of us have also seen a sunset. These beautiful, you know, 
things that happen every single day which, which display the incredible creative power of the Lord. And, and there's no comparison between the pencil sketch and the real thing. But this is what David is saying. It is unsearchable. It is unfathomable when I start thinking about God's power and his greatness and, and all of this. Verse 4, he says, One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. Generations are known for different things. The lost generation gave us electricity. Baby boomers gave us the moon. Gen X gave us the tech revolution. Millennials give us a headache. I'm sorry, millennials. We love you. Actually, research shows that millennials are the most optimistic generation our country has ever known. And so when it comes to the spirit of this psalm, millennials are a lot closer to the spirit of this psalm than the rest of us are. But David here, he wants us to think about the spiritual impact of our generation. We are responsible to hand off the faith from our generation to the next. And we're privileged to give the younger believers after us a living faith, full of truth and the testimony of God's power and greatness and goodness. The Bible shows us exactly what happens when God's people shirk this responsibility or lie down on the job. This is from Judges chapter 2. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And so this is an important responsibility that we have. If you're a Christian here, you have certain uh, opportunities, certain privileges, certain duties and responsibilities that the Lord, our God, the King has given us. And one of them is that we hand the faith off to the believers who come after us. We often talk about the Christian life being a race, run your race, finish your race. And, and that's great because that's an analogy that Paul used and gave us. It's a great one. But this here reminds us that it's also a relay race, right? That we not only finish, but we're finishing our leg and pass the baton of faith forward to those who are going to run the next leg. Verse 5 says, I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts and I will declare your greatness. Listen to this lovely excerpt. To create an atom, what a mighty work. To pack within the confines of a speck of matter so small the eye can never see it, enough, to, enough power to annihilate a city, what a mighty act. To create a galaxy, to people it with suns and stars and novas and supernovas, quasars and black holes, to toss millions upon millions of stars into space like fireworks, what an act. We look out into the cosmos and, and we're just blown away by the great power of God. And we recognize that God has acted through the cosmos. He's acted through history and through miracles and through creation and through revelation and through empires. And then amazingly, we open up the pages of scripture and we find that he also acts through you and me. He says, you know what I can do? Look into the heavens and I'll show you what, what I can do. And now... I want to tell you that I want to work through your life. Jesus Christ himself said this in John 14, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And so the Lord wants to shine the splendor of his great glory through the testimony of your life, your life demonstrating his greatness. And that is accomplished in part when we publicly praise God. It's, it's accomplished in a lot of wonderful ways because our God has a great variety and great creativity. And he says, you can show my great glory by the way you endure suffering. You can show my great glory by the way you preach the truth. You can show my great glory by the way that you praise me publicly in the world around you. Verse 7 says, they will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. God is not only great in power, he is also great in goodness. What an important distinction that is. There have been many powerful rulers in this world. And if you start thinking of the most powerful rulers that our human world has ever known, then cross-check cross that with, and how many of those individuals were good? That's a very short list, if it's 
populated at all. Plenty of very powerful people, very few, very good. God is altogether good. And now for the rest of the psalm, David is going to focus on the lavish, compassionate grace that the Lord has toward the people of earth. Perhaps today you're angry at God for some situation in your life, some past or present suffering that you're enduring. God is not the cause of your sorrow. He is the answer for it. He he is the one that you can hope in. He is the one that can bring uh, uh, protection and provision and refuge for you. In another song, David wrote this, taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him? So reading Psalm 145, we conclude that to know God is to be filled up with joy and enthusiasm for who he is. And so as we're tracking with David, he's invited us to come along with him and he's invited us to put this song into our hearts. And so as we follow along this psalm, and if we get to this point and we say, you know, David, you're excited, but I'm just not. If I look into my heart and find I'm not excited about the God of the Bible, I'm not excited about giving him praise, then then there must be a misalignment in our hearts because the Lord has not fallen short or failed in any way. And it's not that Christians are supposed to go around acting like there's no problems in life. That's not the case. David knew real problems, knew real loss, real suffering, real danger, real questions that he didn't know the answer to. And yet David, who was no stranger to these difficulties, he says every day we can overflow with joyful praise. This giving of a testimony here is like the bubbling up of a fountain of water. One source tells us the phrase indicates frequent, enthusiastic proclamation. When we find ourselves feeling like a well that has run dry, and and who among us hasn't at some point said, yeah, I I feel dry in my relationship with the Lord. I feel a distance in my relationship with the Lord. I just feel like... I don't have that exuberance that I read in a passage like Psalm 145. If you find yourself feeling like a well that has run dry, remember that talk that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman in John 4. Put yourself in her position when you read these beautiful words of Jesus where he said, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. And then after that, the Lord went on to talk to this lady about true worship and how much the Lord loves true worship and how he desires it from us. It's a great pairing of this psalm and, and, and the struggles that sometimes we face. Verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and great in faithful love. We cannot talk too much about God's grace. We just can't. Sometimes Christians are hesitant to really admit how vast God's grace is. We're kind of afraid uh, in the same way that, you know, Paul makes this argument. He says, should we sin that grace might abound? And he says, of course not. Don't. Why would you even think such a thing? But sometimes in, in Christian circles or, you know, in the Christian culture, it's like, well, we, we don't want to talk about grace too much because then everyone will just go crazy and do whatever they want and, you know, and just, and just wallow in sin. Obviously, they don't understand what grace is about and how it changes us and how it transforms us. But, but we're, we're sometimes hesitant to re- admit how incredible and wide-reaching God's grace is. His grace is ample enough to redeem a man like Nebuchadnezzar, who burned people alive for sport. Ample enough to save a man like Saul of Tarsus, who said, my entire life's purpose is to kill people who like Jesus. That's my entire life's purpose. I'm going to breathe threats and hatred against the church. And God said, yeah, I have grace for you. God's grace is ample enough to save the entire city of Nineveh, disgusting pagans who did horrifying things to each other and to others. And God said, my grace is enough for that. Thank goodness that God's grace is that ample because we are no different than any of those examples. Not in our hearts. Maybe you haven't gone around killing Christians or throwing people into a fiery furnace. Great. But in our heart of hearts, we're all the same. 
There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans explains how we, you and me, every single one of us were hostile towards God, that we were at war with him, but by his grace, he came with an offer of peace. He came to reconcile us to himself and to make us new and to give us a hope and a future. That's God's grace. And he does so because of his faithful love. It says it right there in verse 8. Most of us are familiar with the Greek word agape, which is described so well in 1 Corinthians 13. Often we're less familiar with an important Old Testament term for God's love, and that's the word hesed. And it speaks of when a weaker party is in desperate need, but they are unable to help themselves, and then a stronger party comes and willfully chooses to act on their behalf, out of a loyal, caring love. Not because they were paid off, not because of obligation, not because of anything like that, but because of loyal, caring love. He says, I will act on your behalf, you who cannot act on your own. When God describes his hesed love for us, he uses this phrase, this example, this image of being slow to anger and great in compassion. Verse 8 here repeats what God said in Exodus 34 to Moses and to all of us. As Moses stood on the mountain, God said, I'm going to come down. I'm going to pass in front of you. I'm going to reveal some things about myself to you. And in that moment of all the things the Lord could have said, of all the things he could have shown, what he chose to reveal was this. I am a God of compassion and grace, slow to anger, abounding in love. And he said to Moses, and I am the one that maintains this love love to a thousand generations. I'm the one that does it because of faithful love, because of my grace, because of my tender affection for you, I will do this thing. God has every right to be angry at every one of us. He is altogether right. We are altogether wrong. Each one of us has gone astray in blasphemous rebellion against our creator, but instead of revenge, God acts to redeem. His great, gracious, compassionate love endures forever. Verse 9, the Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. An unbelieving world scoffs at this sentence. People love to blame God for every difficulty, every tragedy, every problem. But they do not consider the fact that it is our sin that brought death, sorrow, and suffering into the world. It's our fault. The problems of the world are the fault of humanity because human beings have brought sin into the world and continue to bring sin in the world and sin has consequences. Like throwing sand into the gears of a machine. It's going to cause problems. And and, and at the same time, we find that God stands ready at every moment of every day to rescue anyone who will call out to him. This is an amazing thing. This week, the news was full of reports on Hurricane Ian in Florida the, the, the destruction, the danger, the need for rescue and for help. God has made himself available to rescue any soul of any person in any place at any time. That is an astounding truth that the Bible reveals. He is not a God who loves some and hates others. And even while people reject him, he pours out common grace for them. Jesus said the sun rises on the evil and the good. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. The breath of the Almighty gives us life day by day. We sing that in that song this morning. It's your breath in our lungs. But it's true. Job says, yeah, this is the breath of the Almighty. The reason your heart's beating, the reason your lungs are uh, are breathing is because God is being gracious to each of us. And gracious to each person uh, on the planet right now. Verse 10 says this. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might, informing all the people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. Hold there. There is a day coming when all will be made right on earth as it is in heaven. That's a good reminder. Such a good reminder in pessimistic times, in difficult times, in an election year, in any time, there is a time coming when all will be made right on earth as it is in heaven. And it's not because we accomplish it through our effort. It's because the Lord accomplishes it by his power. And in that kingdom, finally, we will all be on the same page. And it's a page of praise and thankfulness toward the Lord. The king will be ruling all the earth from his throne in Jerusalem. 
It's such a great thing to know that King Jesus is coming back to do what he said, to do what he promised, to accomplish everything that he's laid out in his word. You know, we talk about great leaders from the past. You can pick your favorite president. Uh, You know, obviously Lincoln, everybody used to like Lincoln. Now I gather in the last few years, a few people have pretended they don't like Lincoln, whatever. But we all, right in school, you learn about the great things Lincoln did, the great things he said. Look at this speech. Look at these words that he penned. Look at these activities that he did. But there's no question or there's no hope that he's ever going to come back to be president again, right? We might wish, I wish Lincoln would be our president again, but it's not going to happen. All of his earthly greatness was in the past but Jesus is alive and he is returning and his reign is going to be established on this earth not just for a couple of years his kingdom will have no end and all will be made right all will be restored all will be put together just as it should be on earth as it is in heaven verse 13 picks up the Lord is faithful in all his words gracious in all his actions the Lord helps all who fall he raises up all who are oppressed All eyes look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Our earthly leaders, they don't keep their promises. We know it. They know it. We vote for them anyway, right? And, and And, you know, different groups, they follow how many promises this president or this candidate keeps. None of them keep all their promises. We understand. The Lord keeps every promise he makes, every single one, every single one, every single one, just as he made them. There's nothing good that he can't do. And what he does is kind and generous. Generally speaking, as we look at these verses, kings are not known for helping the oppressed. They're known more generally as being the oppressors, right? They are not the ones known for for feeding the hungry. They are the ones known for hiding up in their palace and piling up riches to themselves while their people are hungry. And yet the king of kings, he places his gentle hands on each and every one of us to help and to lift and to provide. It says there, the Lord gives support to all who fall. The term there speaks of someone who is stumbling or failing or being defeated. And so the image is as God is, is near us and he's looking at our lives and he's watching over us, he sees us starting to stumble under some weight or fall into some failure or, or have these, you know, defeat come on us. And he swoops in and he says, I see you collapsing and I will personally take you in my hand and shield you with my hand and I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He is mindful of every aspect of our lives in this psalm. It's not just about eternal salvation. Eternal salvation is the most important thing, of course. But the Lord isn't only concerned with that. He's also concerned with all the other aspects of your life. Your day-to-day life, your relationships, your temporal future, all of these things. The Lord genuinely cares about those needs. Remember, as Jesus was speaking to the disciples about how we should pray. What does he say? He says, hey, and and ask the Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Because the Lord didn't say, I'm a big picture person and take take that up with consumer affairs. He says, no, you can, you can cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. You can talk to me about eternity. You can talk to me about this afternoon. I care about all of those things. God loves to satisfy. The old Coverdale Bible of 1535 says, he opens his hand and fills all living things with plenteousness. But we also note here how the Lord does his work at the proper time. Sometimes we look and we say, well, Lord, why didn't you satisfy this longing, this need, this problem? What's going on? You didn't heal this person. You you didn't answer this prayer that I gave you in the way that I thought you should. So what's going on? I thought you loved to satisfy. Well, we remember that every need will be met in the kingdom. In the here and now, the Lord does still meet needs, but we wait in expectation for the total fulfillment of his rescue and provision in the next life. Meanwhile, God works in our lives, bringing spiritual fruit in its season. There are going to be spiritual seasons in our lives as God's plan unfolds. Not every season is the same. Not every season is as fruitful. Not every season is as stormy. 
right? There are spiritual seasons, but we can be sure that God is mindful of every day, every need, every situation we find ourselves in. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all his acts. Our God does not cut corners. He doesn't pick favorites. He doesn't take bribes or flip-flop on his principles. He doesn't ignore inconvenient problems. He doesn't follow the trends. He's always righteous, and he has pledged himself to us, not out of obligation, but out of a loyal love. Verse 18, the Lord is near all who call out to him, all who call out to him with integrity. We've heard all these amazing things about God's power and his activity and his dependability and his generosity and his character. Now, most wonderful of all, we're told he is near to us. What an amazing truth. The most mighty, most important being that has ever existed has on his own choice taken the trip to show up at the door of your heart. And he comes to that door and he knocks, hoping you'll open the door and let him in so that he can dwell with you in love and friendship forever. That's what God has done. He's near to all those who call, meaning he will not invade a closed heart. He will not force a person to receive all this grace we've been talking about. He waits for you to choose to allow him in. If you're not a Christian here this morning and you hear all this great talk about the Lord's goodness and his plan and all that, and you think, well, I want access to those things, you can have it. You can have it all. God will not withhold any of it from you, but the Lord is waiting for you to call out to him in faith, turning from your sin and believing in your heart that Christ is the Son of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 puts it very simply. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And as the the entire Bible comes to a close, Revelation chapter 22, in the final verses of the final chapter of the final book, this is what we read. Both the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. But be warned. The Bible also explains that the more you reject this invitation, the more you turn your ears away from this knocking, the more you ignore the Lord, the further you push God away and the door seals more and more tightly. The Bible describes it as the hardening of a heart. As if you hear that knocking and instead of opening the door, you start boarding up the door so that it can't open. Isaiah 55, we read this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive. That's God's message to any unbeliever here this morning. Verse 19, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and he saves them. The point is not that we get whatever we want. This is not a verse that proves or props up the health and wealth heresy. Take the verse together. What is it that the people want in this verse? They're crying out for rescue. They're calling out for deliverance and God fulfills that desire. He is always able to hear and to save. Verse 20, the Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. God's wrath is just as real as his grace. Grace doesn't mean that God looks the other way on sin or that he can say, yeah, never mind about all of that. I'll sweep that under the, you know, uh, the proverbial rug. Grace doesn't mean that everyone is saved. It means anyone can be saved. It's a free gift made available to anyone. But those who refuse the gift, those who refuse to be hidden in Christ, they await judgment without the protection of grace. As I'm sure some of you saw, some of the folks in Florida decided not to evacuate, but to face the hurricane themselves. And as always, when when hurricanes come around, some of those people paid with their lives because they were no match for the fury of the storm. Now multiply that to the infinite degree. And, oh, I'm going to face the judgment of heaven on my own. You cannot withstand God's wrath. You are no match for it because, like all of us, you're guilty. And God is altogether perfect, altogether holy. And he is altogether righteous and just, and therefore he must judge your sin. It's not that Christians have no sin to judge. It's that we have hidden ourselves in Christ Jesus. And he says, I'll pay the penalty for your sin. I will pay the, the, uh, the, the debt that you owe so that you can be hidden in me and be saved for all eternity. 
All you and I deserve is death because of our sin. We are wicked. That's not a word we use much anymore. What makes a person wicked? To be wicked is to be guilty. It means to be a person whose sins have not been washed away. It means to deny Christ and to refuse to bow and worship to him. It means to ignore the offer of salvation that God is graciously making to you. So God comes along and he knocks on the door of your heart. He says, I'll cleanse you of your sin. I'll give you a new heart. I'll cover you in grace. So repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. And if you won't, then you will be destroyed. Only those who do the will of God can enter his kingdom, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Our final verse, verse 21, my mouth will declare the Lord's praise. Let every living thing bless his holy name forever and ever. And so David ends where he began. This was going to be the song that he put into his mind again and again, day after day, and he invites all of us to join the chorus with him. He closes his final psalm essentially saying, this is my everyday reality. God is great. God is good. God is gracious. God loves me. God is near me, and I can worship. That's what he says. That's, that's my song. That's the song I'm going to sing. And David wasn't just being naive. It's just that he was a praiser. Some people you know are complainers. Some are planners. David was a praiser. We can look at some of the openings to his psalms where we're given historical information. And we see that he kept this praising mindset even in some of the most trying, difficult circumstances. We find him writing songs of praise in caves, out in the wilderness, at his baby boy's funeral, and when he's on the run from another son who's trying to kill him. He, he's praising when he's seized by Philistines and when his house is under surveillance. He's praising on his bed under the stars, morning and evening in danger and deliverance. David's choice day by day was, my mouth will declare the Lord's praise because God is great and God is good. A large scale study found that don't stop believing is one of the most common earworms that afflicts people. That's not so bad. Local Hanford boy singing don't stop believing for us, right? Thank you, Journey. Of course, we don't know the original melody for Psalm 145. But the next time you wake up with don't stop believing in your head, remind yourself to don't stop believing this final song of David. The greatness of God's power and work and majesty and mercy and compassion and generosity and faithfulness and goodness. These great things are worthy of our praise every day because every day he's pouring out his grace for us and we have the joy of pouring back a hymn of praise to him every day, forever and ever.